Dove Books on Tape presents A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole. A green hunting cap squeezed the top of the fleshy balloon of a head. The green ear flaps, full of large ears and uncut hair, stuck out on either side like turn signals, indicating two directions at once. Full, pursed lips protruded beneath the bushy black mustache. In the shadow under the green visor of the cap, Ignatius J. Riley's supercilious blue and yellow eyes looked down upon the other people waiting under the clock at the D.H. Holmes department store, studying the crowd of people for signs of bad taste in dress. Possession of anything new or expensive only reflected a person's lack of theology and geometry. It could even cast doubts upon one's soul. He contemplated the long while that he had been waiting for his mother, and therefore did not notice the two eyes that were hungrily watching him from behind one of D.H. Holmes' pillars, two sad eyes shining with hope and desire. You got any identification, mister? The policeman asked in a voice that hoped that Ignatius was officially unidentified. Let me see your driver's license. Is it part of the police department to harass me when this city is a flagrant vice capital of the civilized world? Ignatius bellowed over the crowd in front of the store. This city is famous for its gamblers, prostitutes, exhibitionists, antichrists, alcoholics, sodomites, drug addicts, fetishists, onanists, pornographers, frauds, jades, litterbugs, and lesbians, all of whom are only too well protected. If you have a moment, I shall endeavor to discuss the crime problem with you. But don't make the mistake of bothering me. Let the boy alone! a voice said from the crowd. Go get the strippers on Bourbon Street, an old man added. He's a good boy. He's waiting for his mama. Thank you, Ignatius said haughtily. I hope that all of you will bear witness to this outrage. You come with me, the policeman said to Ignatius with waning self-confidence. The crowd was turning into something of a mob. We're going to the precinct. Good boy can't even wait for his mama by D.H. Holmes the old man again. I'm telling you, the city was never like this. It's the communists. Are you calling me a communist? The policeman asked the old man. I'll take you in, too. You better watch out who you calling a communist. You can't arrest me, the old man cried. I'm a member of the Golden Age Club, sponsored by the New Orleans Recreation Department. Over the heads of the people, Ignatius saw his mother walking slowly out of the lobby of the department store, carrying bakery products as if they were boxes of cement. Mother, he called. Not a moment too soon. I've been seized. Pushing through the people, Mrs. Riley said, Ignatius, what's going on here? What have you done now? Take your hands off my boy. I'm not touching him, lady, the policeman said. I is this here your son? Of course I'm her child, Ignatius said. Can't you see her affection for me? She loves her boy, the old man said. What are you trying to do, my poor child? Mrs. Riley asked the policeman. Ignatius patted his mother's hennaed hair with one of his huge paws. You got plenty of business picking on poor children with all kind of people they got running in this town. How old is he? The policeman asked Mrs. Riley. I am 30, Ignatius said condescendingly. You got a job? Ignatius has to help me at home, Mrs. Riley said. I dust a bit. Ignatius told the policeman. In addition, I am at the moment writing a lengthy indictment against our century. When my brain begins to reel from my literary labors, I make an occasional cheese dip. The policemen are all communists, the old man said. You come on, the policeman said to the old man. He grabbed him roughly by the back of the coat. Oh, my God, Ignatius said, watching the wan little policeman try to control the old man. Now my nerves are totally frayed. Help! The old man appealed to the crowd. It's a takeover. It's a violation of the Constitution. He's crazy, Ignatius, Mrs. Riley said. We better get out of here, baby. Mrs. Riley pulled him around the corner onto Bourbon Street, and they started walking down into the French Quarter. She pushed him through the door of the Night of Joy bar. In the darkness that smelled of bourbon and cigarette butts, they climbed onto two stools. 
My God, Mother, it smells awful. My stomach is beginning to churn. You want to go back on the street? You want that policeman to take you in? Ignatius did not answer. He was sniffing loudly and making faces. A bartender who had been observing the two asked quizzically from the shadows, Yes? I, I, I shall have a coffee, Ignatius said grandly. Chicory coffee with boiled milk. Only instant, the bartender said. I can't possibly drink that, Ignatius told his mother. It's an abomination. Well, get a beer, Ignatius. It won't kill you. I'll take a Dixie 45, Mrs. Riley said to the bartender. And the gentleman, the bartender asked in a rich, assumed voice, what is his pleasure? Give him a Dixie, too. I may not drink it, Ignatius said as the bartender went off to open the beers. They got strippers in here at night, huh? Mrs. Riley nudged her son. In the precinct, the old man sat on a bench with the others, mostly shoplifters, who composed the late afternoon hall. He had neatly arranged along his thigh his social security card, his membership card in the St. Odo of Clooney Holy Name Society, a Golden Age club badge, and a slip of paper identifying him as a member of the American Legion. A young black man, eyeless behind space-age sunglasses, studied the little dossier on the thigh next to his. How come you're here, man? I really don't know, the old man said glumly. I, I was just standing in a crowd in front of D.H. Holmes. And you lift somebody's wallet? No. I called a policeman a communist. Communist? Woo-wee! If I call a police a communist, my ass gonna be in Angola right now for sure. I like to call one of them mother a communist, though. A policeman summoned the old man up to the desk in the center of the room where a sergeant was seated. The patrolman who had arrested him was standing there. What's your name? The sergeant asked the old man. Claude Robichaud, he answered and put his little cards on the desk before the sergeant. The sergeant looked at the cards and said, Patrolman Mancuso here says you resisted arrest and called him a communist. Well, I, I didn't mean it. The old man said, sadly, noticing how fiercely the sergeant was handling the little cards. Mancuso says you says all policemen are communists. Woo-wee, the Negro said across the room. Will you shut up, Jones? The sergeant called out. I didn't mean anything I said, Mr. Robichaud told the sergeant. I was just nervous. I got carried away. This policeman was trying to arrest a poor boy waiting for his mama. He wasn't a boy. Mancuso said he's a big, fat man dressed funny. He looked like a suspicious character. I was just trying to make a routine check, and he started to resist. To tell you the truth, he looked like a big pervert. First thing I spotted was this green hunting cap he was wearing. Jones listened in attentive detachment. Jesus Christ, the sergeant said, trying to arrest a kid with his mama, bringing in somebody's grandpa... Get the hell out of here, Mancuso, and take Grandpa with you. You want to arrest suspicious characters? We'll fix you up. Yes, sir, Mancuso said weakly, leading the weeping old man away. Twilight was settling around the Night of Joy bar. Outside, Bourbon Street was beginning to light up. Neon signs flashed off and on, reflecting in the streets dampened by the light mist that had been falling steadily for some time. A few other customers were in the night of joy, a man who ran his finger along a racing form, a depressed blonde who seemed connected with the bar in some capacity, and an elegantly dressed young man who chain-smoked Salem's and drank frozen daiquiris in gulps. A hey, bartender, Mrs. Riley called. Get a rag. One of the customers just spilled a drink. That's quite all right, darling, the young man said angrily. He arched an eyebrow at Ignatius and his mother. I think... I'm in the wrong bar anyway. I really must run. The young man sighed. Thanks anyway. By the way, where did you ever get that hat? It's truly fantastic. Oh, Lord. I had this since Ignatius made his first communion. Would you consider selling it? I'll give you ten dollars for it. Oh, come on, for this? Fifteen? Really? Mrs. Riley removed the hat. Sure, honey. The young man opened his wallet and gave Mrs. Riley three five-dollar bills. Draining his daiquiri glass, he stood up and said, Now I really must run. Ignatius, we gotta go now, Mrs. Riley said. I'm hungry. She turned toward him and knocked her beer bottle to the floor where it broke into a spray of brown jagged glass. Mother, 
Are you making a scene? Ignatius asked irritably. What's going on here? A woman asked from the padded chartreuse leatherette door of the bar. She was a statuesque woman nearing middle age, her, her fine body covered with a black leather overcoat that glistened with mist. I leave this place for a few hours to go shopping and look what happens. I gotta be here every minute to watch out. You people don't ruin my investment. Just two drunks, the bartender said. I've been giving them the cold shoulder since they come in, but they've been sticking like flies. I beg your pardon, Ignatius said. It's just my luck to have this crap broken all over here just when I'm looking for a janitor. The woman looked at the bartender. Get these two out. Oh, yes, Miss Lee. Don't you worry, Mrs. Riley said. We're leaving. We certainly are, Ignatius added, lumbering toward the door, leaving his mother behind to climb off her stool. Hurry along, mother. This woman looks like a Nazi commandant. She may strike us. Mrs. Riley paid with two of the bills the young man had given her, and as she swayed past Miss Lee, she said, We know when we not want it. We can take our trade elsewheres. Outside, Mrs. Riley took her son's arm for support, but as much as they tried, they moved forward very slowly, though they seemed to move sideward more easily. They continued along the wet flagstones of Bourbon Street. On St. Anne, they found the old Plymouth easily. Its high roof stood above all the other cars. Mrs. Riley climbed the curb twice, trying to force the car out of the parking place, and left the impression of a 1946 Plymouth bumper in the hood of the Volkswagen in the rear. Suddenly, the car leaped out of the parking spot and skidded across the wet street into a post supporting a wrought iron balcony. The post fell away to one side, and the Plymouth crunched against the building. Oh, my God! Ignatius screamed from the rear. If I were driving, I would put the auto in reverse and back gracefully away from the scene. Someone will certainly press charges. The people who own this wreck of a building have been waiting for an opportunity like this for years. They probably spread grease on the street after nightfall, hoping that motorists like you will spin toward their hovel. He belched. Oh, my digestion has been destroyed. I think that I am beginning to bloat. Mrs. Riley shifted the worn gears an inch slowly backward. As the car moved, the splintering of wood abounded over their heads, a splintering that changed into splitting of boards and scraping of metal. Then the balcony was falling in large sections, thundering on the roof of the car with the dull, heavy thud of grenades. The car, like a stoned human, stopped moving, and a piece of wrought iron decoration shattered a rear window. Honey, you okay? Ignatius made a gagging sound. The blue and yellow eyes were watering. Say something, Ignatius, his mother pleaded, turning round just in time to see Ignatius stick his head out of a window and vomit down the side of the dented car. Patrolman Mancuso was walking slowly down Chartres Street dressed in ballet tights and a yellow sweater, a costume which the sergeant said would enable him to bring in genuine, bona fide, suspicious characters instead of grandfathers and boys waiting for their mothers. The costume was the sergeant's punishment. He had told Mancuso that from now on, he would be strictly responsible for bringing in suspicious characters. That police headquarters had a costume wardrobe that would permit Mancuso to be a new character every day. In the two hours that he had been cruising the French Quarter, he had captured no one. Twice things had looked hopeful. He had stopped a man wearing a beret and asked for a cigarette. But the man had threatened to have him arrested. Then he accosted a young man in a trench coat who was wearing a lady's hat. But the young man had slapped him across the face and dashed away. Patrolman Mancuso heard what seemed to be an explosion. Hoping that a suspicious character had just thrown a bomb or shot himself, he ran around the corner onto St. Anne and saw the green hunting cap emitting vomit among the runes. Ignatius pulled his flannel nightshirt up and looked at his bloated stomach. He often bloated while lying in bed in the morning, contemplating the unfortunate turn that events had taken since the Reformation. Since the arrest and the accident, he had been bloating for almost no reason at all, his pyloric valve snapping shut indiscriminately and filling his stomach with trapped gas, gas which had character in being and resented its confinement. 
Was the ludicrous attempt to arrest him the beginning of a bad cycle? The accident was also a bad sign. Ignatius's valve closed again and he rolled over on his left side to press the valve open. How come about that porter job you got advertised in the paper? Yeah, Lana Lee looked at the sunglasses. You got any references? A police give me a reference. He tell me I better get my ass gainfully employed, Jones said and shot a jet of smoke out into the empty bar. You got any experience as a porter? Hell, anybody can do that, especially color peoples. Well, I've been looking, Lana Lee said. For the right boy for this job for several days, she put her hands in the pockets of her leather overcoat and looked into the sunglasses. This was really a deal, like a, like a present left on her doorstep. A colored guy who would get arrested for vagrancy if he didn't work. She would have a captive porter whom she could work for almost nothing. It was beautiful. Lana felt good for the first time since she had come upon those two characters messing up her bar. The pay is $20 a week. Hey, no wonder the right man ain't showing up. Woo-wee! Say, whatever happened to the minimum wage? You need a job, right? I need a porter. Business stinks, take it from there. Last person working in here must have starved to death. You work six days a week from ten to three. If you come in regular, who knows? You might get a little raise. Patrolman Mancuso enjoyed riding the motorcycle. At the precinct, he had borrowed a large and loud one that was all chromium and baby blue. And at the touch of a switch, it could become a pinball machine of lashing, winking, blinking red and white lights. The forces of evil generated by the hideous and apparently impossible to uncover underground of suspicious characters seemed remote to him this afternoon. Although the days had lately been cold and damp, the afternoon had that sudden surprising warmth that makes New Orleans winters gentle. Patrolman Mancuso appreciated the mildness for he was wearing only a T-shirt and Bermuda shorts, the sergeant's costume selection for the day. The long red beard that hooked over his ears by means of wires did manage to warm his chest a little. He had snatched the beard from the locker while the sergeant wasn't looking. On his own time, he was going up to see that poor widow Riley. She looked so pitiful, crying in the middle of that wreck. The least he could do was try to help her. The address that Patrolman Mancuso was looking for was the tiniest structure on the block, aside from the carports. The 1946 Plymouth was parked in the front yard. The tiny yard was completely bare. There were no shrubs, there was no grass, and no birds sang. A woman screamed through the shutters of the house next door. Miss Riley's probably in the kitchen. Go around back. Patrolman Mancuso thanked the woman's voice and walked into the dank alley. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Riley said. How you doing, Mr. Mancuso? Come on in the house and we'll have us a nice cup of coffee. The kitchen was a large, high ceiling room, the largest in the house, and it smelled of coffee and old newspapers. Like every room in the house, it was dark. The greasy wallpaper and brown wooden moldings would have transformed any light into gloom, and from the alley, very little light filtered in. Now, tell me what that man said. How much I gotta pay? I spoke with the man this morning, Patrolman Mancuso said. He got a contractor to appraise the damage. Mrs. Riley took the sheet of paper and read the typed column of itemized figures beneath the contractor's letterhead. Lord, a thousand and twenty dollars? This is terrible. How am I going to pay that? She dropped the estimate on the oilcloth. You sure that is right? Ignatius strode into the kitchen in his nightshirt. Then he noticed the guest and said coldly, Ugh. Ignatius, you know Mr. Mancuso. Say hello. I do believe that I've seen him about, Ignatius said and looked out the back door. Patrolman Mancuso was too startled by the monstrous flannel nightshirt to reply to Ignatius's pleasantry. Ignatius, honey, the man wanted over a thousand dollars for what I did to his building. A thousand dollars? He will not get a cent. We shall have him prosecuted immediately. Contact our attorneys, mother. Our attorneys? He got an estimate from a contractor. Mr. Mancusa here says there's nothing I can do. Oh, well, um, we shall have to pay him then. I made up my mind. Tomorrow we're looking at the want ads in the paper. You gonna dress up and go find you a job. Do I believe what I'm hearing? Ignatius asked. I doubt very seriously whether anyone will hire me. 
You can get a good job. Wait till they see a boy with a master's degree. Ignatius staggered up the brick path to the house, climbed the steps painfully, and rang the bell. Ignatius, baby, Mrs. Riley cried when she opened the door. What's wrong? You look like you're dying. My valve closed on the streetcar. Lord, come in quick out of the cold. Ignatius shuffled miserably back to the kitchen and fell into a chair. The personnel manager at that insurance company treated me very insultingly. You didn't get the job? Of course I didn't get the job. Did you go to the other places? Obviously not. Do I appear to be in a condition that would attract prospective employers? I had the good judgment to come home as soon as possible. Lord, babe, you gotta look up. Look up, Ignatius repeated savagely. I refuse to look up. Optimism nauseates me. It's perverse. Ignatius, get a hold of yourself. Let us look in the afternoon's paper. Maybe they got a nice job in there. Here, listen to this. I've been seeing this ad in the paper every day, Mrs. Riley said, holding the newspaper very close to her eyes. Clean, hard worker man, quite type, quiet type. Give that to me, Ignatius said, snatching the paper from his mother. Clerical work, 25, 35 years old, apply Levy pants. Uh, um. Ignatius yawned, exhibiting the flabby pink of his tongue. Levy Pence sounds just as bad, if not worse, than the titles of the other organizations I have contacted. I can see that I'm obviously beginning to scrape the bottom of the job market already. Just you wait, babe. You'll make good. Patrolman Mancuso had a good idea that had been given to him by, of all people, Ignatius Riley. He had telephoned the Riley's house to ask Mrs. Riley when she could go bowling with him and his aunt. But Ignatius had answered the telephone and screamed... Stop molesting us, you mongoloid. If you had any sense, you would be investigating dens like that night of joy bar in which my beloved mother and I were mistreated and robbed. In addition, the proprietress, Lana Lee, is a Nazi. We barely escaped with our lives. Go investigate that gang and let us alone, you homewrecker. The sergeant would be glad to know about the place. He might even compliment Patrolman Mancuso for getting the tip. Mr. Gonzalez turned the lights on in the small office and lit the gas heater beside his desk. In the 20 years that he had been working for Levy Pants, he had always been the first person to arrive each morning. The criteria at Levy Pants were very low. Promptness was sufficient excuse for promotion. Mr. Gonzalez became the office manager and took control of the few dispirited clerks under him. He could never really remember the names of his clerks and typists. They seemed, at times, to come and go almost daily, with the exception of Miss Trixie, the octogenarian assistant accountant, who had been copying figures inaccurately into the Levy ledgers for almost half a century. She even wore her green celluloid visor on her way to and from work, a gesture that Mr. Gonzalez interpreted as a symbol of loyalty to Levy Pants. Mr. Gonzalez was about to search Miss Trixie's area for his missing stamp pad when the door of the office opened and she shuffled in, scuffing her sneakers across the wooden floor. Good morning, Miss Trixie, Mr. Gonzalez called in his effervescent tenor. And how are we this morning? Who? Oh, hello, Gomez, Miss Trixie said feebly and drifted off toward the ladies' room. Mr. Gonzalez took the opportunity of her disappearance to retrieve his stamp pad. Then the door opened and one of the largest men that Mr. Gonzalez had ever seen entered the office. He removed the green cap and revealed thick black hair, plastered to his skull with Vaseline in the style of the 1920s. When the overcoat came off, Mr. Gonzalez saw rings of fat squeezed into a tight white shirt that was vertically divided by a wide flowered tie. It appeared that Vaseline had also been applied to the mustache, for it gleamed very brightly. Mr. Gonzalez prayed almost audibly that this behemoth was an applicant for a job. He was impressed and overwhelmed. Ignatius found himself in perhaps the most disreputable office that he had ever entered. The naked light bulbs that hung irregularly from the strained ceiling cast a weak yellow light upon the warped floorboards. Old filing cabinets divided the room into several small cubicles, in each of which was a desk painted with a peculiar orange varnish. 
a very old woman hobbled into the room and bumped into a row of filing cabinets. The atmosphere of the place reminded Ignatius of his own room and his valve agreed by opening joyfully. Ignatius prayed almost audibly that he would be accepted for the job. He was impressed and overwhelmed. I have come in response to your advertisement. Oh, wonderful. Which one? The man cried enthusiastically. We're running two in the paper. One for a woman and one for a man. Which one do you think I'm answering? Ignatius hollered. Oh, Mr. Gonzalez said in great confusion. I'm very sorry. I wasn't thinking. I mean, this cess doesn't matter. You could handle either job. I mean, I'm not concerned with cess. Please forget it, Ignatius said. He noticed with interest that the old woman was beginning to nod at her desk. Working conditions looked wonderful. Come sit down, please. Miss Tracy will take your coat and hat and put them in the employee's locker. We want you to feel at home at Levy Pence. But I haven't even spoken with you yet. That's all right. I'm sure that we'll see eye to eye. Miss Tracy, this is one of our new workers. Fine big boy, Miss Trixie said, turning her roomy eyes up toward Ignatius. Well fed. Miss Tracy worked for Mr. Levy's late father, a fine old gentleman. Yes, a fine old gentleman, Miss Trixie said, unable to remember the elder Mr. Levy at all anymore. Miss Tracy has stood by Levy Pence through the years, the office manager explained. Can you begin work today? Mr. Gonzalez asked Ignatius. I um, don't believe that we have discussed anything concerning salary and so forth. Isn't that the normal procedure at this time? Ignatius asked condescendingly. Well, the filing job pays sixty dollars a week. That is certainly far below the wage that I had expected. Ignatius sounded abnormally important. I have a valve which is subject to vicissitudes which may force me to lie abed on certain days. But, but listen, the office manager said confidentially, Miss Tracy here earns only forty dollars a week, and she does have some seniority. She does look rather worn, Ignatius said. Isn't she past retirement? Shh! Mr. Gonzalez hissed. Mrs. Levy won't let us retire her. She thinks it's better for Miss Tracy to keep active. Mrs. Levy is a brilliant, educated woman. She's taken a correspondence course in psychology. I hate to disappoint you, sir, but I am afraid that the salary is not adequate. An oil magnet is currently dangling thousands before me, trying to tempt me to be his personal secretary. We'll include 20 cents a day for car fare. Mr. Gonzalez pleaded. Well, that does change things, Ignatius conceded. I shall take the job temporarily. Take those glasses off, Jones. How the hell can you see all that crap on the floor? The glasses staying on. Jones bumped the push broom into a bar stool. For twenty dollars a week, you ain't running a plantation in here. Lana Lee started snapping a rubber band around a pile of bills and making little piles of nickels that she was taking out of the cash register. Stop knocking that broom against the bar, she screamed. God damn it to hell, you making me nervous. You want quiet sweeping, you get you a old lady. The broom bumped against the bar several more times, then a cloud of smoke, and the broom moved off across the floor. You better be glad I'm giving you a chance, boy, Lana Lee said. There's plenty colored boys looking for work these days. The padded door banged open, and a young man clicked into the bar, scraping the metal taps on his flamenco boots across the floor. Well, it's about time, Lana said to him. The boy opened a flashy, hand-tooled wallet and gave Lana a number of bills. Everything went okay, George? She asked him. The orphans like them? They like the one on the desk with the glasses on. They, they thought it was some kind of teacher or something. You think they, they want another like that? Lana asked with interest. Yeah, why not? Maybe one with a, a blackboard and a book. George winked at her and banged out of the door. That's supposed to be a messenger for the orphans, Jones asked. i like to see the orphans he operating for. I bet the United Fund don't know about them orphans. Ignatius eased himself into the taxi and gave the driver the Constantinople Street address. From the pocket of his overcoat, he took a sheet of Levy Pants stationery, and borrowing the driver's clipboard for a desk, he began to write. I am really quite fatigued, as my first working day draws to a close. I do not wish to suggest, however, that I am disheartened or depressed or defeated, 
For the first time in my life, I have met the system face to face, fully determined to function within its context as an observer and critic in disguise, so to speak. I intend to draw Miss Trixie out rather shortly. I suspect that this Medusa of capitalism has many valuable insights and more than one pithy observation to offer. I have many plans for my filing department and have taken a desk by a near window. Mr. Levy did not appear today. I am given to understand that he visits the business rarely, that he is actually, as Mr. Gonzalez puts it, trying to sell out as soon as possible. So we see that even when Fortuna spins us downward and the wheel sometimes halts for a moment and we find ourselves in a good small cycle within the larger bad cycle. As Ignatius pulled himself out of the taxi, he saw his mother coming down the street. She was wearing her short pink topper and the small red hat that tilted over one eye, so she looked like a refugee starlet. Ignatius noticed hopelessly that she had added a dash of color by pinning a wilted poinsettia to the lapel of her topper. Her brown wedgie squeaked with the discount price defiance as she walked redly and pinkly along the broken brick sidewalk. Even though he had been seeing her outfits for years, the sight of his mother in full regalia always slightly appalled his valve. I am now an employee of Levy Pants. Ignatius! his mother cried, circling his oily head in a clumsy pink woolen embrace that crushed his nose. Tears welled in her eyes. I'm so proud of my boy. I'm quite exhausted. The atmosphere in that office is hypertense. How much Levy Pants is going to pay you, darling? Sixty American dollars a week. Ah, oh, that's all? There are wonderful opportunities for advancement, wonderful plans for the alert young man. The salary may soon change. You think so? Where? I'm still proud, babe. Take off your overcoat. Mrs. Riley opened a can of Libby's stew and tossed it in the pot. They got any cute girls working there? Ignatius thought of Miss Trixie and said, Yes, there is one. Mrs. Riley winked at Ignatius and threw his overcoat on top of the cupboard. Look, honey, I put a fire under this stew. Open you a can of peas and there's bread in the icebox. I got a cake from the Germans, too, but I can't remember right off where I put it. Take a look around the kitchen. I, I gotta go. Where are you going now? Mr. Mancuso and his aunt. They're gonna pick me up in a few minutes. We're going down by Fazio's to bowl. What? Ignatius screamed. Is that true? I, I'll be in early. I told Mr. Mancuso I can't stay out late and his aunt's a grandma, so I guess she needs her sleep. This is certainly a fine reception I'm given after my first day of work, Ignatius said furiously. Ignatius was tacking to a post near his files a wide cardboard sign that said in bold blue gothic lettering, Department of Research and Reference, I.J. Riley, Custodian. He had neglected the morning filing to make the sign. Isn't that nice? Mr. Gonzalez said when Ignatius had stopped hammering. It gives the office a certain tone. I don't understand all this, Miss Trixie said. What's going on around here? She turned to Ignatius. Gomez, who is this person? Miss Trixie, you know Mr. Riley. He's been working with us for a week now. Riley? I thought it was Gloria. Mr. Riley, I, I don't want to pressure you. Mr. Gonzalez said cautiously, but I do notice that you have quite a pile of material on your desk that hasn't been filed yet. Oh, that, yes, well. When I opened the first drawer this morning, I was greeted by a rather large rat which seemed to be devouring the Abelman's dry goods folder. I thought it politic to wait until he was sated. I would hate to contract the bubonic plague and lay the blame upon Levy Pants. Quite right. Mr. Gonzalez said anxiously, his dapper person quivering at the prospect of an on-the-job accident. In addition, my valve has been misbehaving and has prevented me from bending over to reach the lower drawers. Ignatius squatted lower and lower until his great buttocks touched the stool, his knees reaching almost to his shoulders. When he at last nestled upon his perch, he looked like an eggplant, balanced atop a thumbtack. This will never do. I feel quite uncomfortable. Give it a try, Mr. Gonzalez said brightly, propelling himself with his feet. 
Ignatius traveled anxiously along the side of the files till one of the miniature wheels locked in a crack. The stool tipped slightly and then turned over, dumping Ignatius heavily to the floor. Oh, my God! He bellowed. I think I've broken my back! Here, Mr. Gonzalez cried in his terrorized tenor. I'll help you up! No! You must never move a person with a broken back unless you have a stretcher. I won't be paralyzed through your incompetence. Please try to get up, Mr. Riley. Mr. Gonzalez looked at the mound at his feet. His heart sank. Let me alone, Ignatius screamed. You fool! I refuse to spend the remainder of my life in a wheelchair. Mr. Gonzalez felt his feet turn cold and numb. The thud of Ignatius's fall had attracted Miss Trixie from the ladies' room. She came around the files and tripped on the mountain of supine flesh. Oh, dear, she said feebly. Is Gloria dying, Gomez? Oh, we'll help you up, Gloria. Miss Trixie assumed what was apparently a hoisting position. She spread her sneakers far apart, toes pointing outward, and squatted like a Balinese dancer. Don't be nervous, Gloria, Miss Trixie said rocking back and forth on her haunches. Then she fell forward onto Ignatius, throwing him on his back once again. What are you people doing down there on the floor? A man asked from the door. Mr. Gonzalez's chipper face hardened into a mask of horror, and he squeaked. Good morning, Mr. Levy. I was, I was so glad to see you. Is that Mr. Levy? Ignatius struggled to his feet and saw a sportily dressed middle-aged man holding the handle of the office door so that he could flee as rapidly as he had entered. I've taken an unusual interest in your firm, Ignatius said to Mr. Levy. You don't say, Mr. Levy studied Ignatius with certain curiosity. W what about the mail, Gonzalez? There's not much. You receive your new credit cards. I have some letters for you to sign. I have to write a letter to Abelman's Dry Goods. We always have trouble with them. What do those crooks want now? Abelman claims that the last lot of trousers we shipped him were only two feet long in the leg. I'm trying to straighten out the matter. Yeah, well, well, stranger things have happened around this place, Mr. Levy said quickly. The office was already beginning to depress him. He had to get out. Okay, um, take it easy, Mr. Levy said and slammed the door. Uh, Mr. Riley, Mr. Gonzalez said, I'm going in the factory to speak with the foreman. Please keep an eye on things. As soon as the office manager went through the door, Ignatius rolled a sheet of Levy stationery into Mr. Gonzalez's high black typewriter. If Levy Pants was to succeed, the first step would be imposing a heavy hand upon its detractors. Levy Pants must become more militant and authoritarian in order to survive in the jungle of modern commercialism. Ignatius began to type the first step. Mr. I. Abelman, Mongoloid Esquire. We have received, via your absurd comments about our trousers, the comment revealing, as they did, your total lack of contact with reality. Were you more aware, you would know or realize by now, that the offending trousers were dispatched to you with our full knowledge that they were inadequate so far as length was concerned. The trousers were sent to you, one, as a means of testing your initiative. A clever, wide-awake business concern would be able to make three-quarter length trousers a byword of masculine fashion. Your advertising and merchandising programs are obviously faulty. And two, as a means of testing your ability to meet the standards requisite in a distributor of our quality product. Our loyal and dependable outlets can vend any trouser bearing the Levy label, no matter how abominable their design and construction. You are apparently a faithless people. We do not wish to be bothered in the future by such tedious complaints. Please confine your correspondence to orders only. We are a busy and dynamic organization whose mission, needless, effrontery and harassment can only hinder. If you molest us again, sir, you may feel the sting of the lash across your pitiful shoulders. Yours in anger, Gus Levy, President. Mrs. Riley could not believe that it had really happened. There was no television. There were no complaints. The bathroom was empty. Even the roaches seemed to have pulled up stakes. She sat at the kitchen table, sipping a little muscatel, and blew away the one baby roach that was starting to cross the table. The telephone rang in the narrow hall. Mrs. Riley corked her bottle and put it in the cold oven. Hey, Irene, a woman's hoarse voice asked. What you doing, babe? It's Santa Bataglia. How you making, honey? I'm beat, 
I just finished opening four dozen oysters out in the backyard, Santa said in her rocky baritone. You remember when we was out bowling the other night? This morning I was over by the fish market buying them oysters, and this old man come up and says, Wasn't well, you by the bowling alley the other night? So I said, Yeah, mister, I go there a lot. And he says, Well, I was with my daughter. I see you with a lady who got sort of red hair. I says, That's my friend, Miss Riley. I'm learning her how to bowl. That's all, Irene. He just tips his head and walks out of the market. I wonder who that could be. Mrs. Riley said with great interest. That's sure funny. What do you look like, babe? Nice man, kind of old. I've seen him around the neighborhood before taking some little kids to mass. I think they're his grandchildren. Ain't that strange? Who'd be asking about me? I don't know, kid, but you better watch out. Somebody's got their eye on you. The Levy home stood among the pines on a small rise overlooking the gray of Bay St. Louis. The exterior was an example of elegant rusticity. The interior was as sensually comfortable as the human womb supposedly is. Mr. and Mrs. Levy, who considered each other the only ungratifying objects in their home, sat before their television set watching the colors merge together on the screen. Perry Cuomo's face is all green, Mrs. Levy said with great hostility. It looks like a corpse. You better take this set back to the shop. Don't bother me, he said. I'm tired. When I went into town today, I stopped at the company. That always makes me depressed. What's happening there? Nothing, absolutely nothing. That's what I thought, Mrs. Levy sighed. You've thrown your father's business down the drain. That's the tragedy of your life. My father was a very mean and cheap man, a little tyrant. I had some interest in that company when I was young. Well, he destroyed all that with his tyranny. So far as I'm concerned, Levy Pants is his company. Let it go down the drain. He blocked every idea I had for that firm just to prove that he was the father and I was the son. You've never been a father figure to Susan and Sandra. The last time Sandra was home, she opened a purse to get cigarettes and a pack of rubbers falls on the floor right at my feet. That's what I'm trying to say to you. You never gave your daughters an image. No wonder they're so mixed up. I tried with them. Mr. Gonzalez sat next to his little heater, his peaceful soul suspended in a nirvana somewhere far above the two antennae of Levy Pants. The impossible had happened. Life at Levy Pants had become even better. The reason was Mr. Riley. What fairy godmother had dropped Mr. Ignatius J. Riley on the worn and rotting steps of Levy Pants? He was four workers in one. In Mr. Riley's competent hands, the filing seemed to disappear. He was also quite kind to Miss Trixie. There was hardly any friction in the office. Mr. Gonzalez was touched by what he had seen the previous afternoon. Mr. Riley was on his knees, changing Miss Trixie's socks. Mr. Riley was all heart. Of course, he was part valve, too. But the constant conversation about the valve could be accepted. It was the only drawback. End of Side One